So we are going to start our final round table of these two days. And it is targeting the question of governance. So we'll be talking about this uh, relationship of localness and uh, where food is produced and where it's consumed. We are going to ask uh, people to participate in this round table, very different people. We've got growers, we've got researchers. Nabil Hesnawi Amri is a trainer at IFOCAP and he's also, he's also a bit of a geographer, if I'm not mistaken. We've got Joël Guitar, who represents an association called Terre de Lyon. Perhaps you're familiar with that association. If not, Joël will tell you about it. It's a very important association which works on questions of land and land value and constraints and things like that. We have Mylène Morel with us also. She will talk about the PAT, the PAT in the Luberon, which is uh, her specialty. We've got uh, Christian Harlow, who is Tristan Arlo, who is our grower. We've invited Tristan because, in the way we see things, his experience is absolutely unique and, and very um, enlightening for us. And uh, so he can talk to us from a farmer's point of view. And Carolina is going to talk about Madrid and uh, the different uh, actions that local councils uh, trigger to uh, provide land to farmers in the vicinity of the city. So there we are, we're all going to talk about uh, governance and its different aspects. So Nabil is going to kick off and will talk to us about regionalized activities and many other things. So, Nabil, if you could respect this time slot allotted to you. Well, I am going to try and respect that time slot. So, I am talking about the work which I've carried out recently for my PhD about farmers participating in local food policies. Uh, I work in and around Montpellier. So I've been asked to say why this interest has arisen and how it is deployed and what the governance is. And uh, I'll finish with uh, the levers, the different potential uh, issues that create tension. So, to start with. The starting point is also this relationship here between society and the market through what we might call short circuits or alternative uh, food networks. And they appeared in the 1990s in relationship with the different health crises. We had a mad cow disease, for example. And at that time, not very many uh, territories were uh, active. Then there was a second wave, which corresponds to what we were talking about yesterday. That's relocalization, the provision of public foods. Um, we've been working on that since the year 2000, on how we can introduce to organic local produce into food, uh, into school canteens. And then, on a territorial basis, we have a territory which manages the mass catering. More recently, in the years 2000 and the years that followed that, we have been trying to link back all of these different uh, factors with uh, many other links through territorial or mid-scale food policies. So link the players together again, all the way from the field to the plate, but also in different areas. So we'll have a look at the next slide, and here we can see a diagram of uh, what the role of the territory might be. It's the role that we saw yesterday using the lever of mass catering and questions of consumption and how the entire business sector is organized and encouraging it to change. And upstream of that, we have 
the agricultural landscape, uh, the land, production levels, and then downstream how we manage the waste. And so what we see here is that we have many players, many initiatives, many places, and one of the big challenges for a territory is to link all of these initiatives together. Uh, there's a sphere of action which is up, which is quite partitioned right now. So we can identify the different players, public players, associations, private uh, protagonists, businesses, but also there are different themes that can be incorporated. And so the territory as well as having its many competencies in terms of uh, managing town planning and mass catering, so the local authority, for example, can organize some coherency in these initiatives. And here in the next slide, we can talk about the the genesis of my PhD thesis, and it was uh, the fact of specialized farming. Here we're talking about the Montpellier region with all kind with vines, as far as the eye can see, and there was a specific request of uh, of a specific, specific urban basin. And they were out of sync, and um, for the farmers. Urban food requests can be quite difficult to identify and then translate into, into proper work. First of all, because because the way the farms are run, the technologies that they use, they have a sectorial productivist approach, and that would be shifting to a very diversified um, alternative kind of way of farming where you can go and get a whole basket of complementary items. And uh, that factor of being out of sync is also because we are walking, talk, talking about an open project and it's a new way of participating for the farmers. There are specialist forums, you have to manage the demand in, land in a certain way, there are all kinds of special sectors, and here they are in an open platform with many players sitting all around the uh, table. You've got members of civil society, you've got new players also uh, from the private business. So the territory has that role that we were talking about, bringing everyone together, but the territory will also have to play a role in changing the scale or helping protagonists with the change of scale. I'm going to try and illustrate this by talking about uh, Montpellier, where Montpellier was trying to deploy new forms of farming on its land. So this change in scale pertains to, for example, at the outset you might start with defining a problem, saying that you've got very specialized territory. We're going to try and use public land to implement more diversified, more ecological farming. And so that starts with an agri-park. We can compare with uh, Madrid later on. And uh, we're talking about the land here. So this is a commune to begin with. On that scale, we've got a local authority in Montpellier. That local authority manages 200 hectares in a, on an estate, use five hectares of farming, and out of those five hectares, it's going to set up 10 uh, hectares of uh, private market gardening, people who have been displaced, and 10 of agricultural testing so that they can test new types of farming and help youngsters to set up as a diversified organic market gardeners.
So from then on, we see that you then have to be able to help them with this change in scale. How can you shift from 10 hectares of land to a broader scale? So that begs many questions of how to help the farmers. The local authority will limit itself to just handing out the land, allotting the land. Then, when you move along to the results, we see that out of 100 hectares of land available, then the existing farming is maintained. In when 70 uh, hectares are rented out to wine growers in a cooperative. So here we have a new cycle of public action to redefine the problem. So it's the second period. The first period was 2012 to 2014. And now we're moving on to 2018, where there was a new agroecological and food policy that defined a broader problem. That was of transforming the, the territorial food system. So that meant you had to work in terms of the land and the facilities, but you also had to source the food, work on food sourcing and managing the territory. And so from then on, it was a question of using public land as a tool for generating a toolbox to foster a broader range of farming activities. And from then on in, having an impact on the results of other institutions and other networks that could use those same setup tools to broaden the diversification. So this is Terre de Liens, it's a land of bringing people together, which we'll be talking about later. So what's at stake? What are the challenges in terms of politics with this change of scale? So the first challenge is the tension between specializing and being uh, and specializing in one thing and specializing in several things. So we talked about earlier on about how the farmers have to do several things all at the same time, and we also said how important it is to keep your speciality. So there's a bit of a question there. How can you shift from having a specialized territory to one which is more multifunctional? And so that's there's a link between the size and the risk. The bigger you are, the more risks you take when you diversify. The smaller you are, the, the lower the risks are if you diversify. For public policy, there is a certain tension when you shift from an either-or type of policy, are we mainly going to act on the existing farming to then uh, going into a policy where you're doing two things at once, not one or the other, but both things at once, either working on the existing farming and also diversifying elsewhere, which is very tricky because you have to manage then to work on business sectors which are very different. For example, one business which is a town planner and the other which is one for, de for assisting business development. Uh, and here we have to define new categories on the one hand. When you're talking about a commune, you've got the local town planning scheme which determines which zones are for farming, which are for residences, etc. There are some challenges in, turn, in terms of putting buildings back on farming land to boost farming activities. And there, there is tension between uh, the different types of land with buildings on, without buildings on. And uh, so there's a question of separating the function of each area, which is what we've done in the past, and now we have to bring them all together. And just to come back to the hypothesis of rugosity, which we've talked about today, is that something that the uh, rule makers have in mind? Are they acting differently depending on the, f the shape of the town or how far a uh, farm is from the town? Not for the time being. For the time being, we are in a, a zoning frame of mind. We create zones that then uh, make buffer areas between 
rural and urban sections. That could be an agri-park, it could be a, na a nature reserve. And for the time being, these are zones where there is no mixing of functions. You can have a zone which is there to protect the environment or to create farming or to protect farming. But the, the lines are shifting currently. So the idea was this, to show the different levels of change in scale. So how do you define the problem? So it's a question of cognition, how do we see the problem? How, what kind of value do we put on it? What is the outlook? What's the perspective? Uh, a, a fractal perspective is not the same as a concentric uh, perspective. Then, how do we proceed? What kind of procedures do you use? Is it still classic town planning, which keeps farmland away from residential areas? And then there's a question of scale, the scale of the volume, which is changing. What I'm trying to point out here is that there is these tensions are due, and this is quite new, this occurred in 2000. There's tension between private property and public property, and all the question of um, the state claiming that land on the outskirts, land can be private or public, but whatever happens, we know that there is uh, a growing interest about the future of that land. And there is also another tension which is linked to that, that's how rules are evolving over time. We can see quite clearly that it's very hard to uh, align the different timescales. The timescales in politics are not the same as timescales in um, ecology and for the farmers. So. That has to be taken into account also. And I just wanted to finish with that so we can see that we have to manage to bring together three points of view, three perspectives, which are different uh, ways of thinking. We've got geographical zoning on the one hand, that's for the town planners. You've got the perspective of rules and regulations on how you use the land. And that is the business, uh, that's the uh, land developers and the uh, legal experts and the state, which has state responsibility. It is. And there's a third perspective of governance. When you define who do you get around the table, who's uh, going, which is going, which arena are you going to choose, and how do you decide how you move forward in the future? Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. We're now going to hand the floor over now to Joël for the association which is called Terre de Lyon. And this is an association which fights to ensure that uh, there, there is agriculture at the heart of all rugosity. Yes, in uh, rugosity areas, but also elsewhere too. Because uh, you heard the Terre de Lien, the name has been mentioned several times, and perhaps you started to understand that Terre de Lien is a movement of citizens. It's the uh, right-hand side of your triangle there. We are society, because when it was founded, the movement, well, has several units within it. When we were founded, our goal was to involve civil society in questions of protecting farming land and managing land in general, if you want to broaden the, the parameters. So land is a common property and uh, civil society has the right and has the duty to get involved in managing that common property, that common good. And so that was the basis on which we founded our association in 2003, and it's called Terre de Lyon. And so we uh, based our actions on quite a few facts, including the figures, the number of hectares of land which are disappearing each year in France, between uh, 15 and 70,000 hectares disappearing. That corresponds to the disappearance of uh, a whole département or county every five to seven years, 200 farms per week which uh, gives you an, an idea of the speed with which farmland and farming areas are being destroyed either 
because uh, build uh, because houses are built there, motorways, railway tracks, etc., are added, uh, supermarkets. So, on this basis, the uh, association was founded. It's an association that wants to get uh, citizens on board and motivated to get to grips with this question and to speak at all levels whenever possible to ring the alarm bell to say that we are currently not necessarily waste but we're not using pr properly, we're not using intelligently, and we're not using this resource uh, with a forward-looking mindset because this resource is limited once it's gone well it'll be gone it will be hard to get it back once you've covered it with concrete uh, it will be hard to turn it back into farmland so this idea translated into several kind of actions we created events for the public at large we acted for local authorities we contacted ministries so wherever it was possible we would go and demonstrate this idea that civil society had something to say about how land is managed how farmland is managed so it was a question of human beings who were, were calling upon other human beings, members of civil society, to say you should be uh, concerned with this, you should be involved in this, because as a citizen it's your responsibility. So very quickly it transpired that this approach bore its fruit and uh, we were able to participate in a public inquiry. Uh, we uh, addressed several questions about the zoning system and we participated in a debate where we presented our association, but that wasn't enough. The association therefore decided to equip itself with a financial instrument so they could go a little bit further. So when there was any land under threat and when it was impossible to protect it, well, at that time we would ask civil society to invest its savings, to give its savings to this instrument that would then be able to purchase that land which was under threat. Um, so the land was purchased and the instrument that we used uh, promised to remove that land from the market. It would never be sold again. And so uh, it could be used for farming for ever and a day. And it avoided all questions of speculation because every time a piece of land is sold, when the prices are always uh, going up, it also enabled us to find a solution to the problem that has been mentioned on several occasions, that's the access to land has become extremely difficult in terms of price, of course. And that could be one of the answers to the question this morning as to why prices around uh, these uh, zones where land is expensive is even higher than uh, why those products that are grown there are more expensive than other products. That could be uh, one of the answers. And um, it also enables those with projects who don't come from the farming world, it could enable them to have access to a work tool because Terre de Lien, the association, purchases uh, the land and uh, places it at the disposal of uh, anyone with a decent project. And that project leader will on the one hand have a rural lease that will enable him or her to work for as long as possible, it's 25 years or for an entire career. So that will give the farmer long-term visibility because Thierry de Lien, as I said, pledges not to resell what it has bought. And uh, second point, to protect farmland, we also ask the farmer to work according to the organic uh, specifications. 
So it has to be an organic project. So that is an extra tool, uh, a financial instrument that we have created that enables us to, uh, that has enabled us so far to uh, buy about 4,600 uh, hectares. We've got 250 uh, farmers that are up and running now in uh, on our land with a rural lease, and we've got 450 people working on that land. It may be a drop in the ocean, you may think, but it does show that this collective way of managing land is sustainable. It does work. It's feasible. And that is one of the uh, great plus points of Terre de Lien. And uh, that's one of the things which inspired me to become a volunteer. Above and beyond the ideas and the concepts, there really is concrete action. That's um, what, uh, what uh, appealed to me. Saying that we're defending ideas, but we are going to also demonstrate that it works, and uh, we can do that at Terre de Lyon. A bit of question, a bit of uh, a question for some details here. Okay, so you buy some farmland out in the countryside. Was there no debate within your group about paying a high cost for this peri-urban uh, land, which wasn't really very relevant? Yes, of course, uh, there was debate. There was one quite uh, typical case in the Bouche du Rhone, which was just on the edges of the Aubagne shopping zone. It's called, it's a shopping center where there is land on the outskirts and it has been ringed in by the uh, um, local authority. They'd said that the shopping zone will not extend beyond that. So we had market garden land, which was there, but the sales price had suffered uh, uh, from the the price raise, the price increase, as if it would have been uh, possible to build upon it. So the the state took a, uh, or rather, the, there was there's all kinds of negotiations going on there. The uh, owner didn't want to sell uh, very easily, and so we had a land expert came along to say and determine which price the the land had to be sold at. It wasn't market forces that uh, determined the price. So Terre de Lien had to just accept it because um, all of the structures which had been set up throughout France to uh, regulate land costs stepped in and said this is the price at which this land must be sold. But obviously we have purchased uh, land elsewhere in more rural zones and we were wondering if we weren't perhaps getting involved in speculation ourselves because our idea is to get uh, land out of the speculation market. But the conclusion was that, well, speculation, well, we were forced to be part participate in this uh, speculation. We couldn't do any better. We couldn't find any other solution. And to get back to what was said this morning about that uh, uh, rugosity model, when you've got built up zones very soon, they will see their prices go up, go and increase. And to be able to buy that land, it's once again, it's chicken and egg asking the question of who can buy it. And Terre de Lien may, or civil society may, be able to provide the solution by saying that as citizens, we want to have um, local farms we will do what needs to be done. We're here, we've got the capital, and we can uh, satisfy that need. And thanks to our financial instrument at Terre de Lien, uh, well, we, uh, we have something that is worth working on, I think. And uh, that's what you do. We, for the time being, we are perhaps up to date with all of the local, uh, with all of the evolutions in uh, town planning models. I'm not sure if uh, anybody's waded through all of the different models that exist. How much did you pay for them? Well, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to, to say that. Well, you, uh, the SAFA always publishes the value. 
It, it's in the public domain. Uh, well, uh, it's rather my memory which is preventing me from telling you, actually. And I think it must be about 10,000 euros per hectare. Oh, 5,000 euros per hectare. I knew I'd forgotten it. A zero. So for people who are not French, 100,000 per hectare is a tremendous sum for France. Yes, the average in France is 6,500 per hectare. And despite this scale, uh, the authorities gave the, them the possibility to buy it. Yes, to react to that and maybe to show that uh, the our approach resonates among civil society. And with all of the processes underway to enhance the value and, and relocate uh, production, uh, sometimes uh, they give us um, m more um, savings than the equivalent uh, of what land is available. So, okay, we can't we can't just spend uh, the money handed over to us by citizens on any old thing. So, yeah, you showed us the general framework. Maybe I can. Uh, I talked about a movement. There are three pillars. We spoke of two associative fabric, land, and there is a third element, which is a foundation. The Terre de Lien Foundation has been recognized as of public interest, and therefore it's important to be backed up with strong structures. And above all, this type of foundation, which benefits from state guarantees, so when there are donations uh, to guarantee that these donations and uh, inheritances will be maintained uh, over time, and it also allows the foundation to receive subsidies from local authorities. And when we need to buy land, we can therefore call upon three sources of funding, savings through land, the foundation through donations, and subsidies from the local authorities. Therefore, we managed to do what was mentioned earlier on, meaning to set up public-private operations. Public, uh, because there are, uh, the investments are made by the local authorities, and private, because it's money that comes from citizens, therefore it's private uh, funds. Uh, and to once again, to talk about Urbania and this farm uh, that has been much talked about in the media and elsewhere. The uh, land was acquired by Terre de Lien that bought the land, and as nearby there was a house that was put up for sale, the local authorities bought that house and made it available to the farmer uh, um, uh, to whom the land was given for farming. And therefore we gave, uh, we drew up only one lease so that uh, the uh, conurbation could not break the, the lease of the house um, as long as uh, Tia de la owned the land. So I think that there will be questions on this subject afterwards. So I was saying Nabil um, talked to us, gave us a general overview of uh, relationships between uh, food, uh, countryside and the town, and the Terre de Lien on uh, private and public investment. And now maybe we will go elsewhere uh, to see a different experience in uh, which is a territorial food program. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having allowed me to give a testimony as to what is happening in the Luberon. First, some, first of all, some important elements. I'm going to tell you about what's happening in the Luberon Park. 
And uh, what has facilitated the implementation of a territorial food plan in the park? And what were the obstacles? So, two elements to begin with. The Luberon Park is a park, therefore a territory, uh, which has a lot of natural and cultural heritage, but which is very fragile. Therefore, it's a territory uh, forged around projects uh, that within the framework of a charter uh, for the uh, uh, over the coming 15 years, and one a shared project, and that's important uh, for the implementation of this territorial agricultural project. Luberon is a mountain of health. Uh, there is a div wonderful diversity of production, and this diversity is the Mediterranean diet. Apart from fish, we have it all. Therefore, it's a real treasure. It's a, a, a fine food heritage that must be preserved. Preserved, but not uh, you know put under a seal, developed. So uh, we began with the Parks Charter in 2009. That's where the food project began, and in this charter, which is was drawn up by the different uh, actors and living forces of the territory. And the idea was to develop short circuits. In 2000, we, the park has been around for a long time and we developed markets, but in 2009, we really um, picked up the pace uh, with regard to the development of short circuits, development of farmers' markets. Uh, we developed or helped to create uh, farmers' uh, stores that we already had uh, some CSAs, about 10 or so. And 2009 saw the uh, start of a project around canteens to, to supply them with local produce, if possible, organic. Uh, with educational actions, because of course we have to put meaning behind what we're doing. So we also set up quite a few educational uh, activities. And that's one of the five main missions of a park, education actually. And very quickly, the uh, land issue uh, reared its head. And uh, we we wanted to find and maybe help set up uh, farmers in short circuits. And there was a question also of the preservation of agricultural land. And so we talked about zoning earlier on, but we started to develop protected agricultural areas. And there are a few of these now throughout our territory. And from one thing to the next, we set up other actions around territorial organic sectors. So we're working on a an organic uh, a sector with um, ancient wheat varieties. And uh, we will be developing a charter around this. So that is a key action of the park. And so little by little, the action was structured around six axes, which go from land to the territory at the end. And that is when it was in the movement of these territorial food systems and the creation of PAT at, at the national level. And at one point, we said, well, we are a territorial food project. And therefore, it's also interesting to note this, because often we talk about the creation, the implementation, the emergence of PATS through diagnosis, an action plan, etc. Well, that's not how we went about it. It uh, happened little by little. At one point, we said, well, yeah, everything that we're doing can be placed within this uh, coherent framework, which is that of a territorial food project. Yes, maybe you can underline the strengths and weaknesses or the possible obstacles and opportunities in the sense that, of course, there are the pats at the institutional and legal aspects which allowed you to secure things. There's a general atmosphere that is going in that direction in France. But uh, uh, with your institution, what uh, promoted, what encouraged you to change? What helped you to uh, maybe insist on those elements of uh, uh, 
We uh, had some very strong points in the development of our food uh, movement. First of all, that we had a green forum because in the in the our approach is very participative. For us, the territorial. Uh, Food pro project is not that of the part, but of the territory and all of the associations that uh, compose this territory. Therefore, it was following an open forum that we held in 2016, where there were quite a few people, and the question raised was, what if we built our uh, food for the future together? And uh, an open forum means that there aren't any speakers. Everybody is a speaker. And so from this uh, came quite a lot of projects to develop networks. So there were 150 participants in this Green Forum, and it allowed us to present projects uh, for the PNA and to win the PNA. The PNA is the National Programme for Food. It's a program, it's a call for projects which allow you to obtain funding from the state and also from the region. And this really allowed us, uh, the forum, to create a network and to boost the question of relocation of food in the territory and then to uh, have funds so that the associations could work within the framework of the actions that we developed together. So that was a very important step. And what about these 150 people now? Are they still involved? or? Oh, here's another slide, and this is the ecosystem of the Luberon Pat. Uh, there are the communes with who, which we work, uh, in particular for the canteen project. Today, practically all the communes that have a school canteen that are managed directly um, are part of our canteen project. There's a community of communes with uh, which we work. and. Uh, we're trying to adapt the food project to the intercommunal uh, level with regard to policies, and in particular, the economic policies. Uh, so that's a, a good thing. And then there are the farming organizations, and we can see oh, there's a town in here. Uh, the staff out, a lot of associations, cultural associations or local associations. Um, so what is important is that it is a territorial project. Uh, we organize certain actions, but above all, we are there uh, to coordinate things and to maintain the momentum, sometimes through the program. So one of the obstacles is that the national food programs are funded for a period of two years. And one of the obstacles is uh, to uh, find the financial means to participate in the project and to organize the project and develop it. So we always have like small amounts of funding for one year, two years, and then we have to go through another uh, call for project, uh, answer the call for project, and therefore there's a problem of sustainability of the process. Another uh, problem that we will be encountering soon is that there will soon be municipal elections, and therefore uh, elections in the commune, and therefore the park as well. And so this will incur major t changes. So in the organization of the food project, what I try to do is to work uh, on a number of pillars, so with associations, with elected representatives, with companies, so uh, that if some of the parties change, that the ecosystem may continue to operate. However, the future elected representatives were planning uh, some training with the partners to show them what initiatives we have, make them familiar with the uh, project uh, to ensure that they uh, jump on board at the beginning of their mandate. Thank you. We're now going to move on to Mr. Arlo, who we wanted to invite because he is a farmer uh, who uh, had the guts not to wait for the authorities to, to get do something. I can see a spy over there in the room. 
I'm Mr. Arlo. I'm a farmer in the Puissant Reparat. So I touch the Luberon Park, but I'm the, on the wrong side of the Durance River. So that's not very helpful. In 2014, I... Um, work with the gentlemen in the institutions and I was fed up with seeing that we weren't making any progress. I was fed up with seeing that the farmers were governed by elected representatives who didn't understand them. But really, not at all. So what we did with all of our customers is that we set up an association and we asked our clients what they wanted us to do for them in the uh, commune. And then we said, OK, we're ready to do this, but we need to transform our farm and that we work together to achieve these objectives. In one year, we set up a, pro a food project with the middle school of our village, where there are 600 meals per day. So we created uh, a, a vegetable garden within the middle far farm and we visit farms, we collect the seed, the children come and sow in the seed, they plant in the seed, then they eat the vegetables they planted themselves, they collect the seed, etc. Therefore, we launched this type of uh, uh, initiative. We did the same in the nursery school, in the primary schools, where I invited the children. We just let them loose in the greenhouses of strawberries, so they ate strawberries all day. They didn't get sick. We are organic. Um, and we worked with the Safer to help uh, two young people set up in the commune. So we didn't need Terre de Lien for this, but we would be very interested in working with them for certain projects. And then uh, we came up against an obstacle which was very simple, because like the PAT of the Nubéron, some people from the administration encouraged us to uh, obtain the label of Territorial Food Project. Therefore, we uh, answered the administration, we, we filled in the application, and then at the level of a territorial food plan, we cannot uh, obtain the label, but we don't know why. And nobody's giving us any answers. They just tell us you can't be labeled. Well, that's very surprising, because at the level of our commune, we were identified as being a remarkable action according to three criteria with the middle school, with the primary school, and with the old people's home in our uh, commune, so with the, uh, with the department. So we created a bridge between the middle school and the uh, old people's home. So there's an Alzheimer's section. And the children from the middle school come and garden with the elderly people within their home. And they do exactly the same thing um, as they do in their middle school. So we created synergies within the village and we realized that actually people were, didn't talk to each other. They were, that they were in the same uh, village, but the middle school didn't work with the old people's home or with the nursery, etc. So the idea was to create a running thread, a food thread, from the nursery school to the middle uh, school. We don't have a high school in our village, so we stop at the middle school. So the Pants Association thought it was wonderful. The pupils thought it was wonderful. And uh, the what's link missing is the uh, final link. That's the elected representatives. And the elected representatives haven't understood uh, the expectations of society. They're really far behind. So uh, all, as the lady said, soon it will be election time. And all of a sudden, they've all come out of a wood. And uh, they're all, all over the place. And they know everything about it. They know all about territorial food plans. So of course, it makes us happy. But let's see what happens in six months' time. So we carried that project and we multiplied this uh, uh, project. It, once we finished in our commune, there's a, co a commune of 6,000 inhabitants. In our association, we have about 20% of the commune. So we represent 1,000 people. It's a lot. And so we went to the neighboring communes and we realized that out of five uh, neighboring communes, there was only one mayor and we didn't expect it to be him, who was very receptive, and who instantly voted on the municipal council uh, the, uh, for a, a PAT to be created in the commune, and he duplicated ours in his commune. So in the Bouche du Rhone, 80% of the communes are identical to ours, between five and 10,000 people, with a middle school, a primary school, 
the structure is always the same. So we created a PAT that can be duplicated. And once we created that, in our association, we're lucky enough to have an IT technician who's very good, very talented. And they're lucky that my union appointed me to the National Committee of uh, Mass Catering in the ministry. Therefore, I have access to all of the uh, of the guidelines that will come down from the ministry therefore we created a software for mayors uh, to know the real time flow of money and food through all of their canteens and also the management of all of the waste from the field to composting so we will uh, so what is uh, funny is that the draft who was there yesterday uh, a shame they're not here today they don't want to give us a label but they there are they are keen to have our software very strange and uh, we find it funny so no problem uh, we, we're not really worried about the label but uh, I came to bear testimony to one thing when you set off from a small territory with motivated people a PAT objectively can be set up in uh, six months, and it costs zero public money, nothing. And when I see in my department the estate voted 500,000 euros just for the diagnosis, and they've already spent them 500,000 euros, but there's still no diagnosis unless anyone's seen it, but we haven't seen any. And uh, that was three years ago. So at the scale of uh, the life of a farmer, my uh, children are in nursery school and primary school. If I want them to eat healthy and local organic in the middle school, it's up to me to do it. What I feel is that it's better that I get on with it. So we do, we are, we are getting on with it, and we, we are, we're doing it. We were talking about it earlier on. In our department, they created a platform uh, uh, called um, uh, Talk About It in order to draw, identify and draw inspiration from all local initiatives. So all of the people say, this is what I do in Marseille, this is what I do in Aix-en-Provence, etc. And we uh, would have preferred that they create the platform. I. I'm doing it. It would have been far more effective. After three years, now we've got to get on with things. <laughs> I don't want to get into the political side of things. <laughs> Intellectually, I find what you say surprising insofar as, as an elected representative, be it right wing or left wing, represents a local sensitivity. They know what the he knows what the citizens think, and if 20% uh, of the population um, adheres to this, but I don't really understand. How could we explain this, this gap? Well, actually, there is um, a, 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 an agenda effect. When we went to see uh, the mayor, it was when he was working on his land development plan. And in his land development plan, he was going to eat up 40 hectares of agricultural land. And we said, well, we're not... You know, that's a bit of a problem for us. Maybe you can reduce what you're going to take. And above all, introduce a PAT, uh, a food project, in your land development plan. Because that's what's surprising. We put the the uh, land development plans were put through about uh, two, three years ago. And then just afterwards, he said, no, you have to lead territorial food plans. But you've just eaten up all of the best land. And now you're telling us we have to create territorial food plans. It just doesn't make sense. We, we should have thought about this upstream. So what land do I keep to feed the village? What structures do I set up to facilitate the work and logistics to feed the village? Do we need a, a central kitchen? Do we need a school kitchen? Do we need a vegetable processing unit? Do we need a, pre, a farmer's mar a shop? Or do we need a, a logistics platform? That's what should have been done in the land planning project. And then you could adapt the PAT. Well, for the PNU for our foreign uh, friends is the local urban plan. So if you do things in that direction, uh, first of all, land planning and then the food project, it, it can't work. It's impossible, at least for me. Uh, apart from when you're in virtuous uh, municipalities, and there are some. Mine isn't, but when we went to see our mayor, we said, don't do that because, you know, you're just going to blow the agricultural uh, land to bits. Uh, he was unhappy, and of course it's normal because we said, don't do that. 
Well, the fact is that uh, uh, we, we've managed to uh, break a lot of building um, permits, so we've managed to get back a lot of land, but the structure at the com communal level is not ready to, to to deal with a territorial food program. So to extend on, uh, to extend my question, now that the things are underway, won't people change their behaviour? Well, I I am lucky, and it's not because I'm a representative of the department here, but we are lucky to have a president called Martin Vassal who. Um, likes food and therefore protects agriculture. So in the middle school of Pisam Perad, I think I ate with six mayors and three other elected representatives ten days ago to present everything that we've done. So yes, things are moving. Uh, but uh, we've been doing this for about three and a half years um, as a volunteer, and today I've left my farm to come and talk to you about it. And uh, somewhere there is a problem of connections between the citizens and uh, the elected representatives, because it's not normal that uh, four, five, six months just before the uh, elections, uh, people start to become curious about what you're doing. It's not normal. And so uh, for citizens, and this is where I agree with you, uh, we must, at, at any cost, at this, day, uh, this must become stable. We should no longer uh, compromise here, because otherwise what will happen in 10 years and in 20 years, what will we do? So that's the position that we defend. And then uh, at the agricultural level, uh, a territorial food project such as ours creates a lot of agricultural value. Well, we are growing by 30% per year and have been for the past 10 years on our farm. So we will have set up three young people in three years in the commune without uh, affecting our turnover. So we are happy to help partners set up. And they're not competitors, they're partners in our territory to work together to create synergies. We don't see them as competitors that must be destroyed. So that's what we're creating. But it requires a lot of energy. And above all, it's so novel that the institutions just don't understand it. It's not that they're in bad faith. They just can't get their brains around it. It's like as if we're talking Chinese to them. They're saying, oh, you're getting bigger, you're setting up uh, greenhouses, you'll be the, bigger, the biggest, you'll eat up all the others. We think it's the contrary. Did you want to react? Oh, no. Well, I'm sure that you will have questions on this topic. So we will end with a Spanish experience now. Carolina will be uh, talking to us about the park in Madrid. Hello, everybody. I'm Carolina, and I walk, work as a researcher in uh, at the university, and I uh, manage the Arrea Park of Agrarian Park, and I'm going to make my presentation in English. I'm sorry. Okay, so I was invited to introduce uh, the model of the Agrarian Park. Uh, we have different projects in Spain. We have local projects and supra-municipality projects. This is a model that was imported from Italy, uh, the Milan Agrarian Park. And it's a model that looks uh, to solve uh, three big problems that affect and constrain the urban uh, food sufficiency and the problems that the uh, peri-urban agriculture has. These are problems that we have been listening uh, during the whole seminar. Uh, these problems are the pressures on the urban land, uh, the high prices, that the agrarian land has near the city. Uh, the contracts are very short. We have a lot of fragmentation also that uh, is difficult for the uh, farmers to have competitive uh, exploitations when their farms are small. Uh, the second uh, problem uh, it works with, with is the uneven uh, power of the food system and the loss of the capacity of the small farmers to decide 
decide uh, what and how to produce. The third problem is uh, the reduction of agrobiodiversity and also the loss of economic viability as how we have been uh, listening uh, during the seminar. Uh, the plots that are near the city uh, have uh, very high prices. Uh, we have few aids for the peri-urban agriculture also. Uh, many of these farms, um, they have um, uh, they had uh, very diversified uh, farms and right now because of the intermedi intermediates they only sell one or two products so that's also a, a big problem and uh, the biggest problem when we we are near the city is that no young people in the case of Spain want to be agriculture so that's a big problem Okay, uh, so how does uh, the Agrarian Park try to solve this? The Agrarian Park is a model, it's a project, and it's also recognized by law in Spain. It is not recognized in the national level, but many departments, uh, um, well, not departments, uh, uh, comunidades autónomas, Valencia, for example, and Baleares, they have recognized this territorial figure, it's a territorial and governance figure and this figure has to have three tools three tools that tries to solve the problems I just described the first tool it has to have is um, a urbanistic plan that protects the land that delimitates the land that classifies classifies the uses this uh, this land can have and also um, it promotes a uh, multifunctional agriculture. Okay, the second tool we have is a governance entity. Uh, when we have a project that is in the local uh, scale, for example, Fuenlabrada, the, the park where I work on, uh, the participation of the municipality is very important and of the local producers, but when we have a project that has many municipalities, we have to have a governance, uh, not only in the local scale, but always, but also, sorry, in the vertical scale. And uh, the third tool uh, every agrarian park has to have is um, the plan, uh, the plan de gestión et développement, well, say it in French, and uh, this plan is an, a strategic plan, it's like a, a pact, uh, and it has the objective of the park, because not every park has the same problems to solve, and also what this plan does is uh, it describes the strategies uh, and the actions that should be done once a diagnosis has been done in the in the space no uh, a diagnosis of the problems that agriculture have and uh, the problems uh, that have to do with the urban sprawl no so this uh, three uh, tools can be different depending on the on the territory we are. If we compare all the parks we have, the Milan uh, Agrarian Park, uh, uh, Fuenlabrada's Park, Rivas Park, that is, uh, they are in Madrid, also the, um, the Park Agrarian of Jobregat, they are very different. So this is a good model because it's, it's very flexible and it adapts to the problems of the places. Hmm? Uh, the biggest constraint we have in, in, in Spain right now, and in Madrid especially, is that uh, this model is not recognized by law. So it's difficult to work with municipalities and uh, try to uh, convince them about this model, because this model really works well uh, for uh, solving the problems I said before, but when it's not recognized by law, when the uh, different, uh, when the color of the politicians change, well, maybe this uh, projects uh, will change. No, so this is this is a big problem. Can you change this? 
Okay, so in this sense, um, the agrarian park uh, works to reconnect uh, agriculture, urban dwellers, and landscape. This th these three things are very important. Uh, it works uh, basically to enhance local production and to enhance landscape. Those two elements are very important uh, for the agrarian park. And uh, the, um, the principal aspects uh, to reconnect agriculture with urban dwellers is by promoting um, actions that territorialize and localize the food system. Here we have been listening to many actions. Uh, to recovery the local markets, this is very important, uh, mostly uh, farm markets and farm markets that can be in different districts around the city, for example. Uh, it is important also to work to improve the transparency of the origin and how to how this uh, production is doing. We have, for example, a brand for the Agrarian Park of Fuenlabrada, and most of the parks have their own brand with a certain criteria they use also. And finally, improving the quality and the access to agricultural landscape, because landscape is a good way to recognize to connect urban dwellers with the agrarian space, basically because it can become a resource uh, for schools, but also to do sports. And also when you have um, a good quality landscape, it can help to add the value of the products, no, of, the, of the local products. Um, I have talked a lot about the problems um, that uh, the the agrarian park tries to solve, but also the agrarian park uh, should work with all the opportunities it has because of the geographic proximity to the city. The, the most important opportunity to work with is uh, the proximity to the urban market, because if we are saying that the small farmers uh, are not viable. Uh, this is a way to uh, make their economy better if uh, the agrarian techniques or that the, the, the techniques that work for the uh, agrarian park uh, work to um, increment their biodiversity and sell their products uh, um, in short circuits. Uh, okay, another opportunity uh, we have is that uh, we, uh, we can work uh, for the landscape and to make this um, agrarian exploitations multifunctional. So the schools can go and visit these farms, uh, the tourists can go and buy certain local products, etc. And uh, the third opportunity is that uh, local agricultures can produce fresh food. And fresh food is very important for a uh, security um, alimentation. Um, in the case of Fuenlaurada, the techniques uh, concentrate uh, most of their work to promote uh, short circuits, uh, to work with the landscape also, and uh, to regulate ecosystem services. This is um, this is hard uh, because, of, you know, uh, when you have an agrarian space that is very near the city, we have many uses that are not agrarian. And at the end, that has an, uh, an important impact, not only on landscape, but also in ecosystem services. Okay, they, they asked me uh, which are the, the principal actors of an agrarian park. I think there are two levels. The first level is the municipalities, but also the local agricultures. We cannot have an agrarian park if we don't have agricultures that are willing to get in this project. We have many, 
many examples where municipalities want uh, to put an agrarian park in their municipality, but if the agricultures are not willing or they don't have agricultures, we cannot uh, start an agrarian park. So these two agents are very important. And in a second level, um, the the I'm looking French words and thinking in English. <laughs> <laughs> the, the consumers uh, and the, um, the AMAP. No? It's those ones are very important too because uh, if we have local production but we don't have consumers that are willing to pay uh, for that local production, uh, the project uh, will not work, no? In this sense. And, mm, okay, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Peut-être deux points, deux points de. Yeah, can you just clear up a couple of things, please? Could you give us some figures about the number of farmers and how much they produce, so that we can understand that? And second, you've got two key players: that's the the local authority and the actors and the farmers. But what about uh, civil society? Do they have a role to play? Are they in associations, for example? Uh, for example, in in Fuenlabrada, we have 800 uh, hectares, and we have. Uh, 100 hectares for uh, producing vegetables. Um, all of the plots, uh, the, the average is five hectares, and um, they produce uh, before we began working with them. They only sold uh, their products to Merca Madrid. Merca Madrid is like the the big. Um, how do I say? No, intermediate, intermediate that uh, gets all the production of all Madrid and, and then it exports it. Yes, that. And right now they are diversify, diversifying their, their production, but I don't know how many tons of production they, they, they produce. And uh, the other question, uh, how does the... Um, the society or the associations participate in this project? Um, well, uh, we organize uh, different activities and we have um, we have arranged the park uh, so associations can go and do visits. For example, we have an association that does visits during the night uh, by bicycle and it's a way of uh, appropriation no? of a space that they didn't use. Then we have also an association that funded the uh, AMAPs to buy directly to the producers. And um, in the case of Fuenlabrade, it's different of other agrarian parks. Because... Uh, I have to wait. No, I can speak. In the case of Fuenlabrada, Fuenlabrada um, started growing very rapidly. Many people that lived in Madrid had to go and immigrate to Fuenlabrada because the prices were lower. So it's a city that has a has increased its population very fast. So we put, for example, a project with the people that uh, did, uh, that were born in Fuenlabrada to recover the history. And this is a project we have with schools and with different associations to reconstruct the history, the history related with their agrarian history. I don't know if I... Okay, we've tried to sketch out a picture of different experiences which we've had in different places, different countries. I'm now going to hand the floor over to the floor, if anyone in the room has any questions. First question. I'm really impressed by the example which you've presented 
this uh, territorialized, this mid-scale food program. I just don't understand why you keep uh, contact with the uh, town halls. What are you after when you speak to the mayor? Do you want a subsidy? Or do you want the uh, town hall to be the head of the project? Um, I can tell you, if you get a politician on board, they'll be gone within four or five years. I don't understand why you need them. What do you really want from the town hall? I don't want anything. Absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. In reality, in the Bouches du Rhône department, there are practically no farmers left. Nowadays, I've got, I'm 46. I'm already halfway through my career. I look at the younger ones, and they, I can count them on one hand. So if uh, we uh, if we don't exp if we don't explain what our model is to civil society, well, because you need a model, you can't tell someone uh, who's not in farming and is not in politics, you can't tell them just go ahead try it. It's great. You need a model. You need uh, some guidelines. You need a framework. We want a simple framework. We want the uh, uh, pupils, uh, the, the, the parents of the school children can take it. The schools can take this uh, uh, framework. It has to be really simple. Um, as for politicians, we don't want the politicians to take over the power. We want them to do what we are doing. You get it? That's the difference. The trap is that it's free. There is no public budget left. If you say to a politician that's free and it works, can you do it too? That's what we're all waiting for. In theory, unless it's a bit of a weirdo, he'll say, well, OK, I'll do that. So success and the uniqueness of your project is because it's carried by civil society and not politicians. That's its strength. Well, of course. What is our tactic? In a different commune, we set up two young farmers, two female farmers. That's great. There are a lot of women getting into farming now in France, which is a good thing. So we've got two of our spies who are going to do exactly what two of our uh, pawns, rather, we are going to put them in place. They're going to do exactly what we are doing. And those pawns are going to pr defend their project as we are doing it, whether the mayor is in the left or on the left or on the right or in the middle. That's fine. If the, far if the mayor wants to go to the farm and have their photo taken and smile for the camera, that's fine. If they don't want to do it, then it doesn't matter. We're the ones who are at the helm. It's our association. We're in charge. That's so important. It's not the town hall. It's not the mayor. Is the mayor a driving force? Could the town hall be a driving force? Why not? Let's uh, let's work together. We can explain to the politicians what it's all about, and we can ask them if they're prepared in their um, land development plan if they are ready to set up something which will enable all of the producers to earn a, de a, a decent living, or are you going to stick uh, something down a, a back street where nobody ever goes? Because when you've got a politic, politi when you're, uh, you're, got a, you're a politician, you can say, well, we've got a tatty old shop round the back, we'll stick some farmers in there. He'll get the farmers in there, have a photo taken, have it in the local newspaper, and he thinks his job is over. But these farmers, the producers, are not going to earn a living in that tatty old shop down the back street. So we want to have a different view. If you want local farmers, they have to be able to earn a living. I've got a comment more than a question. I think this round table perfectly illustrates what uh, mid-scale um, projects can be. This governance is on two legs, if you like. The first leg is the food movement. Citizens who, like Mr. Harlow, uh, take an initiative and launch actions with their own resources. And the second leg is the, the public uh, authority. 
the public authority is important. The local authority lays down the law, decides on town planning, so they do have some powers, and when they are working for food, will make the situation more stable, will give it scope, will allow it time. And there are times where you have a hybrid results, for example, where all of the players get together for a short time and, and take advantage from the diversity to move forward. That's Terre de Liens as well. They're a good example of that. They've got a public-private partnership for a, a farming project. And to get back to the subject of food sufficiency, in these testimonials that we've had about governance, these initiatives, which from time to time might partner with one or another partner, they create the inertia that we need. So what you've done in your commune, even if a mayor is against it, he cannot uh, use the same arguments as if you'd not done anything. And that is so important. And that's what we can see in the long term when you're talking about governance. These actions, although they may be uh, exhausting and be quite limited, at least they create a context whereby in the future, they will encourage future people or they will um, prevent future projects from being uh, wiped uh, off the playing board before they start. So when you've got a network in a commune or a region working on the subject of food, then you're creating a new context and there's no going back. And so that is a real important role to play in moving forward. All about the, the price that was paid for, ag for per acre, per, per hectare. Um, I did some research with the American Farmland Trust in the US, and there there's a range of $88 per acre to $125,000 per acre. So if you convert that to hectares, if I got it correct, it's 130 per hectare euros versus 312,000. <laughs> Uh, euros per hectare and that I think that that value um, it's hard for farmers to stay in business and that is the willingness that communities have I mean, that that's the 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 value of keeping agriculture in your city that we're not we're not paying fair value for fair market value for so um, I, I want to compliment Esther as well because this especially this last panel is bringing together the nonprofits the local government the researchers the farmers who are all together trying to figure out a way to do sustainable development in a world that has global supply chains that are pulling agriculture apart from from the cities that they're married to. So thank you, Esther. <laughs> yes, I'd like to come back on your thanks. Yesterday we were talking about Catherine and she was saying how interesting it is. We've got farmers, technicians, and researchers. And she comes from the States and I'd like to know what kind of questions you might have to ask us. We were saying yesterday that uh, she'd like to have some feedback. It can be our conclusion, really. What kind of questions would you like research to research into? What would be of use to you? So we could do some tailor-made research for you. <laughs> so you, you're all uh, here. Perhaps you don't need to answer immediately, but think about it. I'm not sure that that's the role of research there. The interpreter did not hear the comment. The microphone was not used. 
my question would be about how we use European funds. I'm wondering if there aren't some uh, local councils that like to have all of these lovely Excel tables with uh, big files full of paper, but there's actually nothing behind it, just to simply put, uh, get hold of these European subventions, which uh, uh, just uh, which just melted or just melted into the uh, commune expenditures. I've got a few uh, examples, but being a kind person, I'm not going to list them. Can I come back on that? Well, let me give you some information that really did finally convince me that I had to go it alone because I thought, well, it's no good. You've got a budget of 36 million euros per year in Europe, which is allotted to France for a program called uh, uh, Eat a Fruit at Playtime. So oh, locally grown organic fruits and uh, of different varieties. So France spends 3 million euros out of this budget, so not even 5% of what it, what it could have spent. And so we speak to the ministers saying, how on earth can this be? How come the European budget is not being spent? Whereas French uh, farmers, you've got half of your farmers who are below the poverty line. You've got one farmer per day who commits suicide. So how can this be? So they thought about it. Because I see them you know, four times a year. And uh, they say, well, we just have to stick to the rules. Uh, so we saw that it would never ever work and so there is a complete disconnect between uh, governance here in France I'm not sure if it's the same in France in, in Spain but in France there's no there's a disconnect between the government and reality they don't know what's going on because that's not the end of the story it's funny as well in, in another way so when we deliver to our middle school we've got a wonderful uh, cook and a great accountant I can't remember the title, but she's the person who pays the bills. And uh, they complete, they fill out this uh, European form. It took three months uh, to, to do all of the paperwork. And then they got hold of 8,000 euros for the year. They were really happy with that. But those 8,000 euros are not for food. They paid for the photocopy machines in the middle school. So here we are giving our time, uh, asking no remuneration. We are volunteers. And uh, when we trigger something which is virtuous, you get 8,000 euros. The, the uh, cook is perhaps going to get hold of it. Perhaps they can employ someone else uh, in the kitchen. No, it goes for a photocopy machine. So every single step of the way in the food chain, there is no co coherency. That people are, are, are trumpeting what their good intentions are, but there's no coherency. And sadly, it takes us further and further away from the institutions, because if I want the children in my village to eat locally and healthily, I'm going to do it on my own. And the uh, only thing which I've been fighting for nationally was we've got a call for tenders at 20,000 euros for all of these all of the canteens. And in fruit and veg, a school canteen never spends more than 10,000 euros in a year. And so fighting on that line, that's why our model is can be duplicated. Any farmer who wants to do what I want to do can do it for the middle school in their in their own village. I would just like to tone things down a little bit because uh, we may be getting uh, a bit overexcited here and exaggerated in terms of uh, European su subsidies. Of course, there's a lot of uh, wastage, it's complicated, it takes a lot of time to do, but it but the region does work really hard to help ma uh, set up these projects and there are substantial economic spin-offs. But uh, what I'm surprised about is the fact that the, the monitoring of the expenditure is quite a constraint. You have to justify every single centime that is um, spent. So 
there was a bit of a, an argy-bargy because we can't really say that we s spent money that was dedicated for one project but it was spent on something else. No, no, that's not, that's not what I was saying. Well, I have uh, set up one of these projects and constantly they were asking me to justify how I was spending every centime because you only get paid after the event. First of all, your establishment has to invest and uh, oh, no, it's not at all the same thing. <laughs> There is European money which can filter through. Yes, okay, it filters through, but as a farmer, as a farmer, we never see that money. Well, you're not paid for your produce. Yes, the, the middle school pays for the fruit and veg, but the uh, middle school wants to get involved into a budget where France gets three or four million euros a year, 95% goes back to you, you know how it works. So sooner or later they're going to uh, not give that subsidy anymore because when the European technocrats say that only 5% only, uh, uh, of that budget is uh, being used, then, uh, then we're not going to give it anymore. So in France, we want when we're talking, when you're creating dynamic in the kitchens, ye, lo, the, the middle school which re receives subsidy should be directed to the kitchen. But it's not the case. It's just poured into a general basket where they can do whatever they want with it. And there they, in this case, they chose to buy a photocopy machine. And symbolically, it's absolutely devastating. Because you say, we did all this. And what is the benefit? Well, two photocopy machines. We have to re-review the way we do things. Yes, we have to solve the problem. So, uh, yes, it also bothers me to confront, uh, to, 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 to put people, you know, against each other, uh, elected representatives, farmer citizens. So yes, there are some weaknesses, but there are also elected representatives who do a lot of good. Uh, we are a good example. In Mont we have, don't have Mont Sartou, but it's a lorry which is very dynamic. I think that if we want to really manage to relocate our food system and to, to, to build the self-sufficiency, every player must play their full role. And it's up to each individual to encourage the others and not in a, in a conflictual situation, but uh, relying upon collective intelligence. So it is tricky, but I think that maybe not everybody, but from time to time, in certain places, we must be able to attain this collective intelligence and achieve good things in this way. I hope so. Maybe I'm a bit of an idealist, but that's what I dream of. Yes, I'm going to go in the same direction from my point of view. Esther was asking about the role of the different players in research. I think that there's a state today where a lot of small things have emerged, a number of initiatives. One thing that seems very important today is firstly to create the link between different initiatives at different scales. That's a real job to be undertaken, to monitor them over a long period of time. And that goes beyond projects, because even in the world of research, we function according to research. We have funding for one project, research project, and then we start another project. So we must be able to monitor what's happening in the long run. And why not feed back things at the right level? So we talked yesterday of moving from an agricultural policy to a food policy at the level of Europe. We can very well use different initiatives and projects to question the way in which we distribute funds. Because you're talking uh, uh, about uh, a European funding for uh, sec sexual development, but to, more largely speaking, we're talking about structural aid. If we talk about food today, we, it's clear that we have far fewer funds given to meet 
uh, dairy products and, and uh, cereal crops. And that we have a lot more funds allocated to that than to fruit and vegetables, quite simply. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Therefore, what allows us to consolidate spaces such as the agrarian park, or how can we connect that? Uh, at the level of the agricultural and food policies. So, regarding research, uh, it is part participative research projects. Here we're talking about cooperation and uh, exchange. That's good, but I think that's where the future lines, and that works well when the projects are set up together with the citizens, even with the elected representatives. It doesn't matter but with anybody who's motivated. And that is concrete, and that's wonderful. And science has an, a tremendous role to play, except that it's still not very fashionable up there. They prefer to give money to uh, biotechnology, etc. What we need to do is to bring them back down to earth and I think the scientists have a, a role to play there. Just as an illustration, uh, the INRA department that I represent is not the largest department of INRA but uh, we're very involved in these participative approaches and so there are other people in INRA who look after far more technical questions but we're part of that movement very modestly. I just had a short question. You talked about a number of uh, young uh, farmers who had uh, set up. Is it easy to do and what type of land? And what I see also is that there is no elected representative in this round table. And um, unfortunately, I believe that not many are very interested in this area. So when uh, the young people who set up, uh, young people we trained or who were sent to us and we selected them, in addition uh, to our existing production so that we were not in competition. And then uh, we, 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 we share the, the, the different uh, plots. So on the small platform, we have 200,000 euros of turnover, and we uh, produce uh, practically one he hectare of melons, of potatoes, etc. There are five market gardens, and according to the uh, watering and the technical characteristics, we say we organize the crop rotation. We say, well, you're going to do potatoes, etc. And, we, and uh, we make sure that there is no notion of competition, and say that, so we, uh, so for basic products, we need quite a lot of a large surface area, and this is how we distribute it. We rotate the crops. And we're all together in a commercial structure where, according to our uh, pro rata turnover, we collect dividends. So somebody who produces very well and is very serious will produce a lot and therefore will achieve a lot of turnover and therefore they will have a lot of shares in the company. In the company. So that allows us to balance things out economically in a very healthy manner. And young people, we lend them the premises to begin with, we lend them the tractors, we make sure that they don't have to invest too heavily and we do this for one or two years. And then if the person doesn't get off the, uh, off the ground, then it wasn't the right person and it doesn't matter, but that's the way we work. However, uh, for researchers and especially agro-researchers, we have a problem in terms of their training. The people sent to us have, have, have been in higher education uh, for two years and they don't know how to do simple maths. And it's uh, very disruptive for us because for us, uh, the what they call the BDS te uh, technicians, a diploma. Uh, they were the, the, the highest qualified people, but in the space of 15 years, we feel that the level has really dropped. So when we, we, we they t t tell us, well, we're going to send you somebody who has a, a BTS diploma, then we almost have to test, you know, whether, whether what they know how to do.
So that's what I see. There's a problem in uh, training and education. In our territorial food plan, we uh, make suggestions to elected representatives and institutions, in particular, um, to, to do apprenticeship in farming. Uh, because there are lots of experts in our field, uh, experts of asparagus, of strawberries, and when we help people set up in diversified organic farming, often it's very di too diversified for somebody who, who's not part of the farming world. We'll ask them for 40 varieties the fir first year, they'll only manage to do 10, there might be a lot of waste, they might be demotivated. We think it's better. Uh, for the person uh, to have three years training, that they spend two months during the strawberry season, two months during the uh, asparagus season, that we pay for this training and that we oblige them. This this can be interesting for Tiananmen, that we then oblige them to save money to buy land at the end of the training. Because when you have your training, uh, then it's the end of the road, then you hit because you have to buy the land. And when you're engaged in training, afterwards you want to set up yourself, logical. And then you'll spend two, three years waiting for land from the Safair. It's very uh, complicated, it's very politicized uh, when they grant land. Sometimes you, you think, oh, I'm going to have it, but it doesn't come. You wait for six months, so I go and find a job somewhere else and I let my project go. It's very complicated. However, we could imagine via Tel for example, that we can identify land for the market gardenings, three hectares in one place. We train them and the person uh, becomes a member of Tel and really invests something in it. It shouldn't be free because otherwise the people don't own their responsibility. So I think that this is one of the missing links in uh, setting up a farm. You say to young farmers, you're going to do green beans, peas, potatoes, lettuce. Uh, and it will be wonderful, but at the end of the day, um, he messes up half of it and there's demotivation. To come back to add to this, uh, I, I imagine that this is happening in a rural area. The case that I supported was really the installation of a farmer in a peri urban zone, very close to Montpellier. with land, which initially was public land. So you're asking what the problems are. Well, the first problem indeed is that of a project carrier. Who are you going to talk about? Who are you going to help set up? In the case that I saw, there were two very different cases. We had one farmer who was already an organic market gardener, who already had experience, who changed places. They were 10 kilometers to the north of the city and came to set up closer to the city. The second case is a group of uh, neo-rurals who had knew nothing about farming who worked in shared gardens, etc. But there, there's a real problem of uh, scaling up. How do I move from 200 square meters to four hectares, eight hectares to manage? So there's a lot of work to do um, of apprenticeship, etc. So I think that uh, this needs to go beyond the local level. So, for example, the Chambers of Ag Agriculture work on farming mentors, but I think that there's a real question of mentorship and apprenticeship around market gardening and biodiversity. So that's the first question. It's the actual people involved. The second question in the scope of public land is the type of contract. And this brings us to the problem of political time. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, move on to the environmental rural lease. In France, for our foreign friends, when you give a lease, uh, uh, it's a political contract. There's an owner which makes available a plot of land to somebody who's going to use it. But the person who uses it commits to using uh, it, as we say legally, as a, as a good uh, uh, as a good um, head of a family, and then there are uh, conditions that are added to the lease, for example, the fact of uh, farming organically. But that means that it's a, a lease that is a minimum of nine years, and therefore it's a very st much stronger political lease than 
uh, a loan, of, a free loan for use. So there, are, there's this type of challenge. That's the second difficulty. It's how can we uh, contr develop, a, set up a contract as a municipality or community of communes with a farmer who uses public land. Then we come back to uh, problems of uh, planning, because very practically speaking, setting up a farm in the peri-urban scope means uh, putting, bringing farming back to a place where it, it has entirely disappeared. And so uh, there's a question of urban dismantling, remantling. For example, in the, uh, in the scope of Montpellier, I, if I, I have vineyards, and as I go through the crisis, I send little plots of vineyard, um, and there are, there are plots where there are no buildings. So how do we set up a farm if you're not allowed to build anything, for example? And the final difficulty, which is not the least, is uh, social justice between farmers. So as a municipality, you help a, a farmer set up, and all of the other farmers come and look at you and say, well, you're setting up a farmer. And so what are you doing with this farmer? How do you take that into account? And it's the same difficulty for the Conservatory of Natural Spaces, who allows uh, uh, an animal, animal farmer to set up in peri-urban level who makes available land, a building, etc. So how does this uh, animal farmer uh, become integrated in its professional environment with it, the pairs, with the other farmers that uh, have the same farming activity as him or her? Two questions with regard to the agricultural knowledge of elected representatives. We realize that, unfortunately, not many elected representatives are, participate in this type of conference. And there are fewer and fewer farmers within a French society also. Therefore, necessarily, there are fewer and fewer elected representatives that have an agricultural culture. And in order to understand things in the long run, and I think it's very important that elected representatives know a little, at least a little bit about farming. And it would be, un be good to look at that as researchers also. And the second thing is you talked earlier on about uh, ag agricultural tests, and I would like to know how these spaces, who decides on where these spaces will be and how they're used. Maybe I can ask you on the agricultural test areas. Um, yes, these areas is uh, land that is made available to a structure. It can be a co-op or it can be different type of structures. Um, so those structures uh, have land. Of course, they pay rent for the land. And then they uh, find project carriers who and invite them to come and to use this land for three years, uh, uh, during which period the project carrier focuses uh, mainly on the test, testing the validity of their uh, agricultural project and their physical intellectual capacity to uh, run that company. And along the way, a certain number of people give up. And at that point, the land is offered to other people who can come and use it. But otherwise, after three years, uh, the person has validated their ability to run the project. And throughout all that time, they were relieved by the structure who carried this test structure in terms of accounting, uh, finances, and legal aspects, but they have acquired a certain number of skills. And after three years, there are two possible cases. Generally, they set off and look for land somewhere. And of course, that they come up against the difficulty of finding available land. Or some test spaces allow the people to keep the land that they were tested on in a far more sustainable manner. So there are two cases. And it's a little bit like um, a, a cluster, a, a, an incubator. 
uh, Terre de Lien is called upon by the uh, Parc Naturel des Alpes that is looking for land in order to create test spaces. And it's the same thing for the Pays d'Or. There are a set number of places. And they say, well, if you have land, or if you know landowners who are ready to make their land available for rent, then we are ready to set up a, a test space on it. Uh, and this is another advantage of the test spaces. Uh, there is an intermediate between, intermediary between the owner and the farmer, which will secure the owner, uh, make the uh, owner feel more secure because to make, they know they'll be paid for the rental of their land. And then there's a structure that checks that um, the land is managed well. And here we're going to touch the problem of wastelands that we're very familiar with in the region. A lot of people have land, but they can't take they they can't make the decision to rent it out because they're afraid uh, of the future. They don't know how they will be able to get rid of the farmer if they need to, etc. So, the a test space. There's one in Pertuis. Not very far from here, in Beaucaire. Uh, so yes, it works, it works. So just to close on the installations and maybe give a very give you a quick example of the way in which Terre de Lien uh, operates. When the association uh, plans to purchase land, because this must be done well upstream of the attribution of the land by the SAFA, the authorities, uh, they must identify the project that fits with this land. Uh, so it's a, a project to purchase the land. So the way we approach things is that we bring all of the territorial black actors around the table who have something to say on land that we want to buy. And in order to ensure that there is social acceptability of the newcomer. So it's important that the neighbors, the municipalities and other are aware of the project. So all of these people around the table um, allow us to draw up the call for application that will be published on the network and they will then select the candidate. Uh, then the candidate that has been selected uh, will have a collective interview and then there are individual uh, interviews before a final decision is made because there are a lot of pro people with projects but we realize that a certain number of projects uh, need to be matured before they can really um, do something.